Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Faculty Friday Research Seminar Series. My name is Anne Marie Parker, and I am a research associate at the Joplin campus of KCU to Dr. Staudinger. Uh, today, I'll be introducing Dr. Withnell, who will be presenting for today's talk. I ask that everyone please stay muted for the presentation and to save your questions for the end. Um, so now I will introduce the speaker and we can get going. Uh, Dr. Withnell earned his PhD in vertebrate paleontology from the Jackson School of Geological Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. <clears throat> While a graduate student at the University of Texas at Austin and a faculty member at Missouri Southern State University, as well as Kansas City University, he has compiled an extensive and diverse teaching portfolio, ranging from the earth to the biological sciences. His research interests include gross human anatomy, neuroanatomy, vertebrate paleontology, and anatomical education. He held the position of assistant professor for biology and environmental health at Missouri Southern State University, and then was hired as an assistant professor at KCU Joplin in the anatomy department earlier this year. Now he is an assistant professor for the Department of Pathology and Anatomical Sciences at KCU. And in today's research seminar, he's going to be talking about some of his lab's anatomical research and 3D digital segmentation. So you wanna take it away, Dr. Withnell? The floor is yours. Thank you for that great introduction. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so today I'm gonna to be kind of uh, discussing some of the research that I have kind of began as a, as a graduate student and I've continued here in my research lab. And so as uh, Anne-Marie mentioned just a minute ago, I am a vertebrate paleontologist. So for those of you that maybe not aren't as familiar with, with me or my research, since I've only been at KCU since January, I'll give you a little bit of background. So I'm a local uh, person just from down the road in Monette, Missouri. Uh, so in 2013, I graduated from the University of Arkansas with my bachelor's in uh, anthropology, in which I worked with Peter Unger um, looking at dental microware of micro mammals from uh, kind of around the world in order to look at paleoenvironmental reconstruction. And then in 2015, I completed my master's degree from Arizona State University in evolutionary anthropology, in which I continued uh, my kind of fascination with paleontology and kind of looking at uh, evolutionary morphology and environmental change. And then most recently, <clears throat> I finished my PhD uh, in the geological sciences from the University of Texas at Austin, in which I focused on quaternary or kind of ice age mammals of North America. And I spent two years on the faculty at Missouri Southern and I've been here at KCU since uh, January. Okay, so the way I've kind of broke up my talk today is I want to talk to you a little bit about um, kind of the traditional way of how we think about anatomical research, then some of the newer ways that technology is allowing us to look at that. And so I'm going to present that to you as kind of a, a snapshot of the capabilities of this particular type of research. Then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of my paleontological research, and then I'll finish up today with um, some of the research that one of my uh, research students completed over the summer. Okay, so how has anatomical research historically been conducted? And so historically, um, the one that probably comes to everybody's mind is dissection. And so dissection has a long and storied history since the ancient Greeks in which the soft tissues of the human body in particular, as well as other animals have been dissected. More recently, uh, there's been a trend towards histology and embryology in which we look at the micro scale um, within human anatomy in order to uh, gain a better insight into tissues and or the embryological origin of those tissues. And then the other two methodologies that I'm gonna briefly talk about are gonna be kind of the deeper evolutionary kind of perspective. And so this is where a lot of my background comes into play. And that is, from a comparative and a paleontological perspective. And so a lot of my research has been concerned with looking at anatomical variations uh, within mammals and trying to get some uh, insight in front, into their anatomy and their evolutionary uh, relationship to one another. And so this bridges into kind of the fourth category, which is phylogenetics. And so a lot of you probably aren't necessarily that familiar with phylogenetics, but Basically what that is, is tree thinking. So thinking of the tree of life, how things are related to one another. 
And so this is a very common tool within paleontology, especially, and in um, namology and, and broader zoology uh, for using anatomy to be able to tell something about how animals are related, especially in context when we don't have things like DNA. Okay, so today I wanna to talk to you kind of about a, another avenue of research uh, for the anatomical sciences that has been examined from a clinical perspective for, for a while now, um, but only within the past 30 or so years has it really started to transform into uh, kind of what, what we see today. And so what I'm kind of hinting at are radiographic data sets. And so radiographic data sets, these are things that probably everybody's familiar with when they go to the, the doctor with a broken limb or some sort of a injury um, or, or pain in the abdomen or your head. You think of things like x-rays, CTs, MRIs. And so traditionally, uh, clinicians view a lot of these in two-dimensional slices. And so things like your CT, uh, so computed tomography or your magnetic resonance imaging, so your MRI, takes a series of slices of these images of the, of the three-dimensional object. So, and then, and then stitches them together so that you can render it in three dimensions. And so <clears throat> in order to kind of look at sort of the uh, avenue of research that I'm gonna be hinting at today, which is three-dimensional segmentation. So taking those data sets, it's gonna require data sets that have the possibility of being rendered in 3D. So these are data sets that have um, imaging that is taken from maybe a rotating platform that's going to allow for more than just one plane to be imaged at one time. And so the most common uh, types of data sets that I, I'm referring to are MRIs. So they got things like um, examining the, lig the ligaments of your knee or your shoulder, your elbows, as well as you can get uh, contrast MRIs for things like looking at the different aspects of the neuroanatomy. You can do uh, CT, and within CT, uh, there's several subsets in which you can uh, render three-dimensional uh, analyses. And so a couple examples are micro CT, which uh, over here on the right, this is an example of a micro CT of a, an isolated tooth um, to maybe get at its um, development, the developmental nature maybe of the enamel of that said tooth. And then there's also stuff like CT angiography in which you have some sort of a contrast injected into an artery or a vein in order to be able to have that pop out when you look at the, uh, the CT scans. Okay, so this is kind of the traditional way that clinicians and people have looked at these type of data sets. They look at them slice by slice and then uh, try to gleam some sort of a abnormality from the normal anatomy. But what I have been doing is using three-dimensional segmentation. So three-dimensional segmentation, as I uh, hinted at, takes these 2D slices that traditionally are uh, imaged in three planes in order to render it in 3D. But the issue with, with the three-dimensional capabilities is that it does require very major computing capabilities. Uh, because it is not uncommon that when once you start the digital segmentation process for you to take a data set that maybe was only a gigabyte of data to begin with, and it may turn into 10, 20, or maybe even 30 gigs worth of data by the time you're done segmenting it. So you have to have uh, like high-end graphics cards, high-end levels of RAM for computing, so random access memory, as well as large processors. And also a lot of the programs traditionally, a lot of the traditional programs have been used for this um, type of research, such as uh, Avizo and VG Studio are very expensive. So we're talking, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 subscriptions yearly. But recently there's been within the past about eight years or so, there's been um, a, a new software come out um, called Dragonfly. And so Dragonfly is this wonderful, uh, research avenue in which it is entirely free uh, for non-commercial researchers. So it does have a paid subscription, like if you're working in industry, but as long as you're affiliated with the university and not trying to profit from the research you're doing, um, it remains free. So it is a great resource and in my opinion, uh, is more user-friendly even than those very expensive uh, paid versions. 
And so that is the, the program that my lab utilizes. And so segmenting uh, is a time consuming process. So you, the traditional way is you literally go slice by slice, selecting the images or the aspects of those images of, of importance. So for example, you're segmenting the abdominal cavity and you're segmenting the abdominal aorta. You could go slice by slice selecting the abdominal aorta until you've gone the entire length of that image. But today there is um, quite a bit of progress moving towards kind of the artificial intelligence. So using what is called machine learning or deep learning in which the Dragonfly software uses uh, very complex algorithms to learn essentially how to segment much like a human would as they're doing it. So what traditionally would have taken um, several hours for a, a, an individual to segment out uh, now can be done in a matter of minutes, which is uh, pretty amazing with amazing uh, accuracy as well. Okay, so what do I use 3D segmentation for? And so I use it to study anatomical variation in a non-invasive manner. So what this means is that in, within anatomy, especially there's the traditional, when you're looking at gross anatomy, there's the traditional dissection cadaver-based research, which is great. Um, I'm not advocating for replacing that. Uh, I'm just advocating for a kind of a supplement to that type of research because these 3D segmentations can be completed on uh, living individuals. So without any invasive procedures. So data sets are able to be uh, much larger because there are a lot of uh, free open source type of data sets such as from the NIH uh, in which you're able to have a much larger sample size than you would for maybe a single cadaver lab. I also use it for evolutionary anatomy, so paleontology. So this is what predominantly my background uh, is looking at. And so a lot of my background is looking at uh, dental, uh, dental variation patterns and using that to be able to uh, reconstruct paleo environments. And so I kind of continuing to do some of this research uh, as well as taking some kind of non-traditional paleontological preservation uh, instances. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a little bit, but I have a, a paper coming out on uh, where I segmented out a fossilized owl pellet. And if you don't know what an owl pellet is, that's the regurgitation um, process that an owl produces when um, of like the bones and hair and the, the non-digestible types of material, uh, which provides an amazing uh, snapshot into the paleo environment because traditionally those elements are going to be very dispersed and destroyed. But digital segmentation allows for it to be, remain kind of intact. And then I also advocate for being a very um, excellent anatomical teaching tool. And so students have found that their knowledge of a given region uh, greatly expands when they go through and segment it out. So it's much like dissecting and that the beauty of dissecting is that you go layer by layer, seeing the three-dimensional aspects of how, uh, how structures are associated to one another. And this also allows for that with the ability to erase and go back if you happen to mess up. So it's, it's a great anatomical teaching tool um, that students find uh, quite enjoyable. Okay, so now I'm gonna kind of just kind of show you um, the program a little bit, show you just some uh, images that I uh, rendered from uh, open source data sets, just to give you a kind of a snapshot of the capabilities of this type of uh, research. Then I'll talk a little bit more specifically about some of the research that my labs uh, actually completed. And so this is what the general interface of the program Dragonfly looks like. And so this is a gorilla skull. And so this was a series of slices from a CT imagery in which you can look at it in the uh, X, Y, and Z planes. And then ultimately you can segment the whole bone out, or you can segment out individual bones in order to generate a reproduction of, of the object. And so then once you've done that, you're able to, uh, you could, if you wanted to 3D print this. And so that is another thing that my, my lab is doing is taking some of the data um, that we generate and generating STL files, which we can 3D print, which my uh, lab has a 3D printer for doing so. 
Okay, just kind of giving you just some cool other, just cool things, just cool morphology. Um, if you're interested in evolutionary morphology, there's all sorts of things that can be done. And the amazing thing about this is I, I literally downloaded the data set and, you know, two minutes, then I segmented that entire skull out in about 30 seconds to generate that model. And so obviously, if you are going through and segmenting individual bones, individual uh, arteries, nerves, that's going to take a little bit more time. Um, but if you're wanting to produce just kind of these beautiful, amazing, large, um, very publication quality type of imagery very quickly, this program is a, a great example for that. So it's really, really useful for, for things that have very stark differences in density. And so what I mean by that is uh, when you're looking at a CT or an MRI, there's a very big difference in the density of bone versus soft tissue. So the better the quality of the scan, so the better the, that density is captured, the distance differences are captured, the better the imagery you can uh, complete. So this is a picture of a, what's called the North American worm lizard, which is just this kind of weird legless lizard uh, found uh, down in Florida. Uh, you can also use it on fossils. Uh, so you can take things like uh, this theropod dinosaur, um, also known as Shuvia deserti, known as the desert bird. You can segment out its skull and you could, if you wanted to, you could gleam into the evolutionary uh, history of the evolution of the theropod or ultimately the lineage leading to modern day birds. Um, if you were interested in, in that type, maybe loss of teeth that would have been kind of occurring at this juncture in uh, bird evolution. You could also take this, which uh, is a 3D uh, endocast of the, the cranium of this dinosaur. And so I took the fossil skull that was uh, found and scanned, and I basically segmented out the space inside of that cranium. And that allows you to look at things like the evolutionary history of neuroanatomy, maybe the cranial nerves, the foramen of the skull in these different animals. So it just provides some really cool um, avenues of research that would be very difficult if you were just solely dealing with, uh, with the fossil or the skull itself. Okay, and then here is uh, an image I, uh, or a video I generated that is made possible by the Visible Body Project, which is a kind of large database in which different aspects of human anatomy were scanned with the hopes that, that this sort of uh, work would be done. So I'll go ahead and play this for you and just kind of show you from a, in a three-dimensional um, way, kind of what, what the software is capable of. Okay, so this is a, um, a donor that donated, donated their body for the Visible Body Project. And so this is just a, a volume rendering. This is not a segmentation in which I literally took the data and rendered it as a full volume. And then I pulled the slices through that so you can look at uh, the evolution or the, the, the differences from maybe anterior to posterior um, within different aspects of the structure. So you can create that very quickly um, in the case that you're trying to visualize maybe some sort of an anatomical area quickly. So this is another data set. Um, so I actually produced this yesterday. I just kind of sat down and I wanted to see kind of how much I could get done in about two hours of segmenting. So there are certain aspects of this that could be a, a little bit more cleaned up, but I just wanted to show just the, the quick capabilities of this type of um, research and the amazing findings you can actually find. And so I took this uh, data set from Masudi et al. 2018, in which they were looking at uh, the uh, using this as a diagnostic tool for diagnosing pulmonary embolisms. And so I took this and I just kind of started segmenting out the different aspects of things like the lungs, um, the pericardial sac of the heart, the great vessels, the bones. And I found um, several anatomical variations that are actually pretty cool and, and actually pretty rare. So one you may notice immediately that looks weird and it's not a mistake. At first I was a little concerned maybe I made a mistake, but I looked back at the uh, at the scans and it is in fact a bifid rib, which is pretty cool. Um, that's only found in about one to two percent of the population. So that's the kind of thing that maybe you wouldn't have caught on just a flipping through the, the 
MRI or the CT scans, you may have not seen that, um, but by rendering in three dimensions, you see it in association with these other structures. Um, another kind of uh, unique thing is this foramen here in the sternum. Uh, so a sternal foramen, and this is a little bit more common than that bifid rib, but it, it's only found in about 10 to 15% of the population. So this individual had two congenital um, kind of rib sternal based uh, anomalies that were not documented in their record. So that, that was kind of an interesting finding. So now I'm gonna just kind of show you a video, just kind of showing you the rotation to show you um, about what I completed in about two hours yesterday. Okay, so as you can see, um, when you're looking at the lung, you can see it has its lobes. The back side of that probably looks a little odd. And that is because that right lung is the lung that they had the documented chronic pulmonary embolism in. So that kind of uh, tissue that looks um, not as dense as the rest is, is uh, scarred lung tissue. And in fact, kind of the inferior portion of that right lung has actually uh, been surgically partially removed. And so now we'll kind of keep rotating this and show you how you can take something like the lung and look at the vessels within, within the inside of that. So you can look at the pulmonary arteries, the pulmonary veins to get a better uh, idea of the, maybe the propensity towards a pulmonary embolism. So that's the green that you see within the lung. That's what that is um, showing you as I segmented out the, the arteries and veins I just did in one color just to show the vessels. Um, as well as you can trace things like the, the bronchial um, tree within the lung. <clears throat> okay. So you can also um, use this to look at things like the vasculature. So this is a CT angiography in which dye was injected into uh, these vessels so that they could really pop out on, a, on the traditional scan. And so what we get is something that looks like this. And so you could look at um, all the, uh, the major vessels of the vasculature that's supplying the brain and the cranium and possibly uh, see where maybe a, a, an aneurysm is occurring and the best approach maybe for a surgeon to approach that in order to, um, to, to fix the issue. So it provides amazing opportunities for looking at vasculature. Uh, you can use it, as I showed you, you can use it for bones really, really well. So here's a, uh, a patient that was complaining of lower back pain. And so as you can see, they have some um, remodeling here on the, the lower lumbar vertebra, which is indicative of uh, kind of chronic issues with their lower back. And so that's just a way maybe of visualizing for a patient or exploring maybe the developmental nature of that type of uh, physiological condition. Here's just kind of an image just showing you uh, just the segmenting out of like kidneys, abdominal aorta, uh, the inferior vena cava, just to show you just kind of the capabilities again. Okay, so that's just kind of a quick run through on potential avenues of what you can use this from an anatomical standpoint. So basically the takeaway is that you can pretty much, if, if there's a 3D image of it and it's of decent quality, you can render it in 3D with um, great accuracy and, uh, and, and produce great results that might have been missed in a traditional cadaveric dissection and or maybe a surgical uh, procedure. Okay, so now I'm gonna briefly talk to you a little bit about some of my paleontological projects, which I've already kind of alluded to. Then I will kind of end us today on talking about what one of my uh, uh, now second year uh, med students did over the summer. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, my research has been focused on Ice Age. Okay, so what I mean by that is kind of the, roughly the, about the past 5 million years or so. Um, so I've been, studying uh, Ice Age mammals of North America uh, in order to understand how something like a changing climate, so the moving of the North American ice sheet, how does that affect, um, from a faunal standpoint, how does that affect how uh, communities, animals uh, disperse? How does it connect how genetically? How, how, how does it affect when some of them become isolated? 
And so there's a tremendous amount of potential avenue of this research for understanding the modern biota and understanding kind of the kind of climate crisis that we're today setting in and its potential effects on, um, on animals from a morphological standpoint. Okay, so I mentioned uh, earlier uh, this kind of project about the owl pellet. And so this project kind of started at, while I was a grad student at UT. And so my dissertation was kind of focused on uh, micro mammals. So when I say micro mammals, I mean just the small little critters that are like voles, lemmings, and muskrats that traditionally um, a lot of people, frankly, just don't care about and or uh, their bones get destroyed. But the nice thing about them is that you can find them by the handfuls in these uh, Ice Age fossil sites. So they provide a great opportunity for studying evolutionary dynamics. And so about 15 years ago, this fossil was found outside Salt Lake City. Um, and this at first was quickly noticed to be a pretty cool fossil in that traditionally you don't get uh, fixed specimens uh, of these arvicoline rodents. Typically you get them as just piles of isolated bones. So quickly it was realized that this is gonna provide maybe a different opportunity to look at associations of these fossils than what you normally would get. So we CT scanned it. And when we did, this is what it produced. Um, so on the lower right, that's showing you just kind of a CT volume rendering of the portion of that photo uh, to its left of where the fossils are. And then on top of that are all the individual teeth that were segmented out. And so what makes this particular project cool is because uh, usually our Vicklin rodents are really territorial in that they don't like sharing territory with other species. When what we found is within this one fossil, there were uh, four different species of arvicoline rodents. So we hypothesize that this is probably a, an owl roost. Um, so a accumulation of these owl pellets probably time averaged. So over a period of time, and we don't have a clue what that time was, um, but it gives us a better snapshot of the changing dynamics in the Salt Lake City area um, over the past about a million years. So it was pretty, pretty cool. And it was made possible by CT scanning these and, uh, and segmenting them out. So here's just kind of some zoom ins showing you the diversity of kind of teeth you can get um, from, from doing this. So you have some teeth of these arvicoline rodents that are rooted. So you can see here, they have roots kind of like what our, our teeth do. You get others that are what are called ever growing teeth in which they are like a conveyor belt. They just kind of keep growing throughout the rodent's life. Whereas these have a finite, when they get wore down, that's it. Okay, so two, two pretty different um, types of dentition and two pretty closely related uh, group of, groups of animals. Then here's just kind of more images of, of some of those rootless uh, varieties. Okay, then another kind of aspect of kind of that rodent project is what I call the Ophiomis project, which is looking at uh, this accumulation of bones that was found in Idaho. And so it's kind of similar to that L pellet in the sense that we see association of teeth that we normally wouldn't get. Because as you can imagine, when you have a rodent that's smaller than your pin, that if you leave it outside for a million years, it's going to get pretty destroyed by, um, by the environment. And so this uh, particular uh, fossil was well-preserved in a uh, river, river uh, embankment in which it was quickly covered up. And so what this allowed for was us to be able to reconstruct the dentition of a single skull of this rodent with the genus name Ophiomis. And so another cool aspect of this is traditionally you don't get um, uh, things like the humerus or the scapula preserved with these rodents. Typically you just get isolated teeth because teeth are made of enamel and are more resistant to wear uh, and damage than, than just the regular bone is. So that was pretty cool that we were able to uh, segment all these out and yet still preserve all of them together. So it's uh, from a paleontological perspective, it's really cool because it's a way of studying these fossils without destroying these fossils for future, for future studies. 
Okay, and again, it's just kind of showing this is a, an older lineage of these orbiculine rodents in which you see rooted dentition. Okay, so now probably a little bit more you guys are interested in, a little bit more uh, medic medically focused um, was uh, some of the research that my lab did over the summer. So over the summer, uh, student doctor Chris Kruger um, participated in the summer student research fellowship program in which he developed a project and spent the summer uh, developing that project with the aims of ultimately producing um, a conference presentation, which he is submitting uh, later this month to the annual meeting of the American Association for Anatomist um, in Philadelphia next early next year. And uh, also, he is also currently writing up this research that I'm getting ready to describe to you of his. And so Chris came to me and was said he was interested in internal medicine and uh, was interested in getting a project off the ground quickly that could have potential um, kind of surgical significance. So what we came up with was uh, Chris was going to look at hepatic arterial variations with an eye towards surgical significance. So at the time, Chris was uh, in, in the thick of um, the GIGU uh, course in the first year curriculum in which he was diving through the different aspects of the digestive system. And uh, he took a liking to the hepatic uh, arterial variations that he saw when he observed the other cadavers. So he wanted to explore that a little further. And so what he did is he took a series of CT scans that are archived by the Cancer Imaging uh, uh, Archive Institute, which is uh, basically a, a branch of kind of a data repository for a lot of the NIH projects. And so he took um, about 20, 27 or so data sets that were uh, compiled by researchers that were looking at pancreatic cancer and took that and isolated that down to uh, look at the variations in the branching pattern of hepatic arteries. So Chris took these uh, series of CT images of the abdomen. And at the time, I had just kind of started at KCU and there was, COVID was in full swing. And so there was delay on some lab equipment that would be capable of, of rendering dra the Dragonfly software program, as I mentioned, at, which has very high demands. And so Chris uh, completed kind of this initial preliminary kind of uh, take on, on this by looking at uh, the program 3D Slicer. And so 3D Slicer, also can produce some amazing images. It just kind of does it kind of at a lower resolution and it's a little bit more cumbersome. So in the future, Chris is going to kind of take this and reintegrate it with, with uh, his research within, within Dragonfly. Okay, so this is kind of what that looks like again, kind of the three planes in which he segmented it out. And this is what it kind of looks like when he segmented it out. So he would segment the liver as well as things like the, the portal vein, um, the abdominal aorta, to try to get a better sense of the branching pattern going to things like the gallbladder or the liver or whether it's branching off of this, uh, the celiac plexus or part of the superior mesenteric arteries, uh, which are the sources for a lot of the anatomical variation that is encountered in this pretty complex and highly variable uh, region of the human body. Okay, then once Chris did that, we 3D printed this. And so, we 3D printed a couple models in which they were done at about a 75% scale of what they would in, uh, in real life. And that was just simply due to the capacity, uh, the limitations of the 3D printer in the lab is that we just, it wasn't quite large enough to, to fully print a life-size, so to speak, uh, liver. And so we did this in order to help better visualize some of the anatomical variations that uh, Chris described. Okay, and so this is basically the process of what it basically produces. So it produces this model with all these stilts, and so then you have to individually kind of break these off and then kind of piece it back together. So this is when your three-dimensional models become very useful because you can take what you see here and you'd be like, how the heck do I know where these go back? And you can take something like this and, I'm oh, sorry, I thought there was a, I was thinking that there was a uh, image there, but I'll show you in just a second. You can take the three-dimensional images that you produce and be able to kind of piece it back together uh, easier. 
Okay, so kind of the results of Chris's uh, work was that he used this uh, surgical classification for hepatic arterial variations. And so it's called the CRL classification, in which it's describing the common, the right and the left hepatic arteries. And then it has kind of sub descriptors describing whether you get accessory vessels or full replacement of vessels and, and vasculature. Then to further complicate it, you have things like the gastroduodenal artery, the celiac artery, the aorta, superior mesenteric artery, and the left gastric artery, giving contributions to the vasculature going to the liver. Okay, so what this has been found is that there are roughly nine types. And then Chris found one that didn't fit into any of the nine types that have been uh, completed. And so the study that was originally uh, done on this looked at about 2,500 um, patients to look at this variation pattern. And Chris found one that was not captured in that 27 or 2,500 uh, sample size. Okay, so here's kind of the results of what he found. So he ended up finding 19 in what are called type one, which is so-called normal anatomy. This is what you would have learned um, the branching pattern in your, your gross anatomy textbook. And so the majority of them fit into that category. But as you can see from the table, there are variations in which sometimes they have different branching patterns. So for instance, there he found two that fit what are called the type two, which is where you have a replaced right hepatic artery um, coming from the superior mesenteric artery instead of the celiac uh, trunk, which is where the textbook anatomy would have it coming. Then just kind of highlight a couple more of these uh, variations he, he found. He had uh, the type nine, which shows that you have these common hepatic arteries coming directly off the aorta. Then this unclassified, which has kind of this uh, undocumented level of complexity in that it has things like the common hepatic branches coming off the superior mesenteric artery and accessory left hepatic artery branches off the left gastric artery. Okay, so the, the main branch kind of going out towards the stomach. So this has tremendous amounts of significance from a cl clinical standpoint in the sense that if a uh, clinician knows that they're needing to go through uh, and perform some sort of a surgery, that can kind of be dangerous sometimes when you're not entirely sure of the branching pattern, maybe of some of these vasculatures. And so this allows for a relatively quick um, avenue in which you can segment these vessels out to get a better sense before you go in surgically uh, for some sort of a, a repair. Okay, so here's just kind of a uh, video of, of Chris's, one of Chris's models in which you can, you can see nicely that branching pattern going to the cystic, um, so going to the gallbladder as well as going up to the liver, and then some of the branches that are going out towards uh, like the the left gastric, so out towards the stomach. Okay, so just kind of conclude, uh, I just want to kind of hint at some of the advantages of 3D segmentation and why I find it to be a very useful technique. And so one is that it's kind of cheap compared to alternative methods. And so initially, I mean, the computer is not cheap to get it, but at the end of the day, if you're trying to get a large sample size, of say 50 cadavers, that gets quite expensive to, to, as well as the logistical nature of having to store and process that many uh, specimens. There are many open source databases, so you don't have to be solely responsible for gathering your own data. So you can do that in the case of like paintological data sets, obviously no, no two fossils are identical. So you need to, you're gonna CT or MRI scan that individual um, specimen, but in the case of especially biomedical um, and anatomical, like gross anatomical human stuff, there are a lot of databases through the NIH, the Cancer Imaging Archive that have data sets by the thousands that are ready to go already. And so this allows for robust sample sizes. So one of the issues with a lot of anatomical sciences is oftentimes uh, publishing uh, 
projects that have low sample size can be challenging. And so this allows for much larger, robust sample sizes because you basically have the world at your disposal. So uh, as far as clinicians taking uh, samples from their patients or what have you, and these national archives, uh, the, the only thing is, is you have to jump through paperwork hurdles, but that's, that's a small price to pay for uh, getting these robust sample sizes. You don't have to wait on specimens, okay? So if you, once you get your approval through the different review boards, you can just uh, hop right in and start, start with your project. It has very little uh, learning curve and you're able to kind of dive in rather quickly with a rather rudimentary understanding of the anatomy. It's very easy to collaborate with other researchers and share uh, information uh, and share uh, project ideas. And so you can ask as many questions as you can think of. So uh, a lot of techniques, you're kind of narrow in your scope of what you can ask, but not in the case of three-dimensional segmentation, you are kind of at the mercy of your mind. Um, so if it is captured in 3D segment or in a 3D imaging modality, you can use segmentation to learn something about it. So outside of the anatomical sciences, this is used in things like uh, geology, so it's used in um, like a porosity of rocks. So looking at things for like natural gas and oil productivity, it's used uh, in archaeological standpoints by looking at microstructures of how things like pottery are were fired, you know, two thousand years ago. So there's a lot of potential um, routes you can take this research outside of just purely anatomical. And also, it's just kind of a blast. So it's, it's uh, a type of research that kind of comes like a game. Uh, it kind of gets addictive. You just kind of, you can sit down and before you know it, the whole day is gone because you've just sat there segmenting. Um, it can just be a lot of fun. And especially when you find something you weren't expecting. So like in the case of anatomy, you find an anatomical variation that when you go and look at the library and you look online, no one's documented before. So there's a, it's a big repository for a lot of knowledge and a, a huge place in which research in the anatomical sciences can really uh, jump forward with. Okay, so that is kind of all I have for you today. Um, I appreciate you having me and let me kind of talk a little bit about um, my interest and kind of some of my research background and kind of some of the projects that myself and some of my students have uh, partaken in. And for all the students that are, are at KCU and or Southern watching this, uh, feel free to uh, contact me about potential projects. Um, I have a wide variety of interests as, as my background uh, indicates. And so I'm always open to new ideas. So thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Dr. Withnell. Um, that was a lot of great information. And if anyone has any questions now, um, feel free to either use the raise hand function or just unmute and ask, or you can type in the chat and we'll answer those and moderate them as they come in. Hey, Dr. Withnell, this is Nick Lukas. I am a first year student. And I know you, I heard you mention that the, you can use the Dragonfly technology as a supplement to current gross anatomy dissection. I was wondering if you know of any applications to say first year medical education that we might consider in future future years? Yeah, so uh, yes, it's, it is a great repository. Uh, the, the biggest, the biggest issue uh, from a first year uh, medical student standpoint is, is computing capabilities. Um, so your traditional, you know, most laptops, unless you have just a very, very high end laptop are not gonna be able to render it. Um, but if you have a, uh, like a computer, a desktop, like a gaming, a high end gaming type of desktop, a lot of them can do that. And it's, yes, it is great. It would be great for med first year medical students when they're trying to understand that this muscle is is setting, you know, in front of this this vessel or in front of this vessel, and then there's this bone or what have you, this nerve going there. It is a great. It'd be a great tool for for, for four first years. It just it's it's time consuming, so you'd have to be committed to it of, of segmenting and getting a, a good understanding. But yeah, if you're interested in like surgical surgeon surgical interest, especially um, would very uh, would benefit a lot from it especially. 
Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have a question as well. Um, I know you talked about it being, it can be very um, like detailed. So I was wondering with like structures as complex as the brain, um, you know, there's a lot of tiny arteries and veins that go through. I was wondering like how, how detailed it can really go. Um, I don't know if that's something that has been explored yet. I was just curious. Yeah. So you're kind of at the mercy of whatever your data set is. And so different types of uh, scanning modalities are going to allow for different imaging capabilities and rendering capabilities. So like that image I showed that had um, like all the vasculature there of the brain, that was a very specific targeted type of uh, thing in which they were looking at the vasculature. Um, so there are different, different uh, ways of getting different scans that will emphasize certain structures. So if you know what you're interested in, you have a better chance of being able to tailor it towards what you're interested in, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, so, so basically what you're saying is if, if you have it and they have data that's about that structure, then you can render it without any problem. Yep, yeah. So that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, and even, uh, even, so one quick way that you do the segmentation is to use uh, things of like what's called a density map in which you can really separate things that are of great density differences. So obviously in the brain, that's challenging because a lot of the brain, it's so dense, it's all very dense. So that is a technique you can't use as much in the brain, uh, but you can, at the end of the day, you can manually segment out all of it. And that's where I was kind of getting into that deep learning um, AI type of uh, capabilities for the future in which Dragonfly has a way of actually kind of figuring out how you segment and then remembering that and applying it to future segmentation. So it's, it's kind of in the early developmental stages of kind of pushing forward for that, but it's definitely kind of the direction it's heading in, which is pretty cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think like we have a few hands, hands yeah. raised. So uh, Dr. Wolf, you want to go first? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks. I, I enjoyed that a lot. I, I was curious in terms of structure function. I mean, my, my druthers, if I ever get a lab going, would be to set up a, a library of functionally characterized tissues uh, from a rat, for example. And, and so I was curious if you've ever been involved in 3D reconstruction, say, of a skeletal muscle or uh, some other organ as it, uh, as it changed. I mean, my interest is uh, to have functionally characterized tissues as the, uh, during the etiology of hypertension and to, to know how those changes, how those tissues actually responded differently to various vasodilators, various constrictors, and then to be able to go in there and correlate that with the, the types of things that I think you could potentially see here. So I, mm -hmm. I've played with, with tissues, for example, uh, cells where we was looking to see if whether or not stuff got inside of the cell and using the z-axis on the microscope and, and, and taking images at different planes and stitching things together. Uh, so what I was curious about is what kind of resolution do you need? I mean, if you were going to do that, do you have how many sections would you actually have to have? What, how, what thickness before you can uh, or do this with some degree of precision? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. So yes, uh, it has, I have not specifically done it myself, but I do know it is used and you can, if you want to poke around kind of on the Dragonfly website, it has a lot of work that others have done in the, the variety of fields that might um, answer your question maybe better than I can. And so I guess, um, yes, it can be done. Uh, it's just, you're again, kind of like you're at the limitation of your data set. It depends, you have to have an eye for what, for that at the beginning. So you have to have a scanner that is capable of taking slices on the micro scale. And so you can get these uh, slices and through like a micro CT uh, machine, especially. I know that might not apply as well to uh, what you're interested in, but it can take it on a very, very fine. And the better, the closer those segments, the slices are to one another, they're obviously the better uh, the resolution you're going to have for being able to track 
uh, cellular change and stuff like that across uh, space. And so, yes, I, I think it could be done. You just have to have to chase down the proper, uh, the proper way to scan it for sure. So like uh, in the facility that could handle that. And then after, after you get the data, yeah, you could absolutely segment it out as long as it was at a scale that you could see, visually see a difference at, you could, you could segment it. Um, all right, it looks, I think Noah, you were next. You have your hand raised. Hi, Dr. Wilkman, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I was wondering if you knew of any studies that um, kind of compared the uh, findings and abnormalities of that can be seen in 3D segmentation that can't be seen in 2D, like traditional scans? Yeah, so there there is quite a few studies actually, because that is kind of, especially like, a, that's kind of the dichotomy of a lot of med school education right now is what are the benefits of dissection-based anatomical study versus virtual, right? And so there are, yes, there are studies that are have explored what you can and can't see in one or the other. And honestly, uh, the conclusion is that on a large scale, there's little difference between the two in the sense that um, you're still gonna document large variations, but where this particular modality excels where like a gross, gross dissection might not is on the minuscule small scale in which you just wouldn't see it as, as with your eyes. And you would likely destroy it as you're kind of cutting through the, the tissues. And so uh, it's been found to exceed the, uh, the normal dissection on, on kind of the smaller end scales of things. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And then, um, sorry if I say this wrong, Susan, you also have your hand raised if you have a question. Yeah, um, um, I had a question about uh, Dragonfly, the user interface. Um, I've worked with uh, graphical user interfaces before, like Partech, it was used for like genome sequencing. And uh, typically my question is um, like, is, is the software based on like cloud computing? Like is the, all the intense segmentation and um, you know, processing power is it done on the cloud so that you can access the Dragonfly software from any computer? Or is it done from like, you, it has to be on like a super high performance PC? Yeah. So that's a good question. So it is done uh, like in-house. Yeah. So it does not rely on cloud computing. Um, as of right now, there's no like good supercomputers or anything like that you could you could render it on just because the lag time I think would be too great for a lot of these data sets. And so especially like kind of getting back to kind of what Dr. Wolf was talking about, about um, like what at what scale um, the these finer resolutions, the bottleneck you get in there is the smaller your slices, the larger uh, computing capabilities that are needed in the sense that if you have more slices stacked immediately right on top of each other, it's going to, the data set's going to balloon out rather quickly. So yes, uh, it can be run on, it, it depends on your data set. So like if you're using a very detailed, very high-end large data set, it's going to have to be done on a very high-end computer. Uh, but if it's kind of a lower quality data set that you're maybe you're just trying to create something visually appealing, um, it can be done on like a, a, a decently high-end like gaming computer. But yeah, it's not, it's not the type of thing that you log into like uh, the super cluster and, and, and do it on. Yeah. So, so then research would probably have to be done in, in the lab. Like you'd have to come in and do the lab. Yes. Yeah, so I have a I have a computer set up here on the faculty wing um, that has has it in which you can uh, digitally segment your heart away uh, as long as long as you want to. Um, so yeah, so it, it, again, like it, it is possible to do it on your own. Like you can get that's the that's the really nice thing about it is it's not like a lot of the scientific paid subscriptions in which you know we're paying ten thousand dollars and you have to do it on that one computer because that's the only one that has a license. That if you had a computer that was capable of doing it you can request your own license through, um, through Dragonfly and they would grant it to you being a student and being a researcher. And so that's, that's a cool aspect of it too. So like I, at, at home, I have a personal computer that has the capability of doing it just so I can you know, play around with it there as well. So yeah, so it just kind of depends on what, what you're doing it with. But yes, for the most part, um, most student focused research using it would have to be done on campus. 
Cool. Uh, thanks for answering my questions. Yeah. Any other question, Dr. Wolf? Yeah, I, I was curious if the cadavers here are uh, scanned beforehand. At my previous institution, they were doing CT scanning and I think even MRIs on, on the cadavers before they ever cut into them. And it crossed my mind that if we had some of that going on here, that that would create additional research opportunities or opportunities for students to actually see what they were cutting into before they started cutting into it. Yeah, absolutely. That would be an awesome, uh, an awesome avenue to pursue. And I know in the past it has it has been done uh, with some of them. Um, since I've been here, it, it has not been done, unfortunately. Um, I'm guessing it's uh, time hauling the cadavers to design in-house CT or MRI. Um, if there was like some of the larger med schools, especially uh, probably Creighton uh, that you mentioned was probably uh, had, the, had an in-house one that was probably just a little easier logistically to get it to maybe. Um, but it, yes, it has been done, but no, it's not currently being done. Are there any other questions before we uh, end the meeting? Um, if not, I'm going to put a quick link in the chat. This is just to the Faculty Friday MKRC page. So if you um, know somebody that wasn't at today's presentation, uh, this will be posted on the Canvas page as well as you can see future presentations we'll be having and some presentations that already happened this past semester if you maybe missed one. So that link's in the chat. Uh, you can also get there on Canvas. It's just it's right on the front page if you go to MKRC, then it's right in the middle at the top, Faculty Fridays. Um, so yeah, thank you again for your presentation, Dr. Withnell. Thank you for having me, appreciate it. All right, bye everyone. All right, have a good day. <laughs>